there's seven species of turtles in the world? Yes. <laughs> there they are there, and somebody's going to count them and say, but there's eight there. <laughs> this, this one here is not now regarded as a separate species. It was re it's regarded as a subspecies. It used to be called the East Pacific Green, but it's now just recognized as a as a subspecies of the green turtle. So this is the green turtle here, eating grass. So the green turtle is a herbivore, if you're all, if, uh, I don't know if you're aware of that. This is our loggerhead, and the loggerhead is chasing that slug there. So the loggerhead is a carnival. Yeah. Loggerhead's brown all over. Yeah. Green's white on the belly. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so sweet. At Monrepo, um, some years ago, we came up with a hybrid, a natural in, in a natural situation, where we uh, relocated some loggerhead eggs back into the hatchery, and the, out of those eggs, she produced some green hatchlings as well as her own hatchlings. And when we investigated, because as you know, a turtle lays every two weeks, when we investigated her second nest. That's exactly what she did. She had, was producing green hatchlings, loggerhead hatchlings, and hatchlings that were all mixed up. They had little short flippers like loggerhead, but they were white underneath and dark on the back like a green, etc., etc. So um, we produced a hybrid. It's the first time it's ever occurred in the world. That inhalation went worldwide. Um, it happened naturally, it hadn't happened in a pen or anything like that, it happened out in the sea. This loggerhead just came ashore, which we'd been following for years, and she laid these eggs on this particular season, and there they were. Um, and I was sitting with Cole one night, many, many weeks after it all happened, um, and he was putting papers together to send worldwide, and I sort of, I may have had a couple of Bundy rums and cokes, I think, I'm not sure, and I said to Cole, I said, so, so what, Cole? They're two turtles, they live out in the ocean, they swim together, they look similar to those people who don't understand and he pointed his finger at me as only a scientist could and he said, Michi, you're forgetting one thing. And I said, what's that, Cole? He said, one's a herbivore and one's a carnival. And yet they've cross made it. So I don't, I don't know what the young are going to eat. Anyway, so that's our green. That's our loggerhead. That's our hawksbills. Now, those people that are, that are swimmers here will have hawksbills out. You'll see hawksbills out in the water, but they don't choose to nest on this island, okay? That's our beautiful Australian flatback, and I'll bring a um, couple of photos up about her later. That's our beautiful Australian flatback, and when I call her that, it's because she's found nowhere else in the entire world but here in Australia, and we have some of them nesting at Monry Cove in Bundaberg, where I worked for 30 years. So that's the Australian flatback, this guy here. That's the Kemp's Ridley. That's the olive ridley, and we don't worry if it is one anymore, and that's the giant leatherback. That's the biggest turtle in the world. Uh, that guy there, I've got a photograph to show you when we turn the lights on before we go up the thing. I do have a photograph here to show you of a leatherback turtle, and you'll be amazed at the size. They can be well over a metre in length, over a metre wide, and weigh well over a tonne. Um, they're not, you don't see them very often in Australia. We do have them sometimes in our waters, but they don't choose any site here in Australia to lay eggs. I took a call at Monry Po years ago when I was working, and this guy said to me, um, he said, you guys there know a little bit about turtles? And I said, oh, we pretend to anyway. And he said, well, I'm going to ask you a question. And I said, yeah, what's that? He said, me and my mate were out fishing the other night, he said, and we I've got to admit, he said, we'd had a few tinnies, but he said, all of a sudden there was this noise beside the boat, this <laughs> something breathing in a big breath, and he said, and I looked over the side of the boat in the semi moonlight, and he said, oh, it was a turtle, and he said, I swear it was as long as our tinny. He said, is there such a thing? And I said, yes, there is. He said, oh, thank goodness, I can keep drinking. <laughs> His mate, his mate had told him he was having nightmares, or his wife had told him he was having um, nightmares. No, uh, he'd seen a leatherback. So, as long as a tinny. Massive turtle. And we had one, one, they don't nest here normally, but we had one crawl up on the beach at Monterey Cove many, many years ago. 
Um, she did lay eggs. We rang Col in Brisbane, and Col was back in Brisbane. We said, Col, we've got a letter back on the beach. He said, yeah, pull the other leg. But when we finally convinced him that it was a leather back, he said, um, rope tied to a tree, do what you want, don't let her go back to the water, I'm coming. And it took about three and a half hours to get from Brisbane to Bundaberg in those days, and he did it in about an hour and a half. Um, so, but uh, we eagerly awaited her hatchlings to emerge, and they didn't. So when two or three weeks went beyond when they should have produced little hatchlings, but we thought, okay, we might, if one of these survives, we might be starting a new colony of leatherbacks here in Australia. But uh, when several weeks went by and they hadn't emerged, we investigated and she'd laid an entire clutch of unfertile eggs. Oh. So, she, so she hadn't made it. She just desperately wanted to get rid of the eggs for whatever reason, and she came ashore and wanted to come later. Hmm. Okay, you're aware that likes and turtles don't mix, so I haven't got to go into that. Uh, they're totally drawn by, um, by lights, as you know. Um, years ago when I started um, rescuing turtles out here, nearly 40 years ago, we did the right, what we thought was the right thing for the visitors, and we let all the visitors buy a, a drink and um, sit along outside the bar. And we let them go down there in front of the bar so that people could watch them go down the beach and swim away. And that was fine, um, but then half an hour after we'd let them go, somebody would yell out and say, hey, have we got turtles coming up to the bar to order a drink? What, what happens is that they would swim out to the edge of the outer reef, and once they got far enough away from the island, they could see the lights of the island, because they weren't over the edge of the bank, of the beach, if you know what I mean. And they turned around and they came back following the light. So they're totally drawn by artificial light, which causes a huge problem around the world, as you can well imagine. We all live on lights, a lot of us, car lights, house lights, torch lights, um, none, of us, none of us humans can operate at night time without a light of some kind, and all lights attract turtles, which is a big problem worldwide, massive problem. You can see what's happened there, just to prove our point, we've stuck a torch on the beach at Monterey Cove, had a clutch of 100 hats to go, and the whole lot of them have gathered around the torch bed. And yet the torch was 100 metres away from where they were running down the water. Now that one is only one and a half or one and a quarter kilometres long. It's the, uh, it's the most um, um, biggest loggerhead nesting site in the southern hemisphere. Um, and it's just on the outskirts of Bundaberg. Those who haven't been there or don't know about it, it's only 13 kilometres from Bundaberg City. And it's where most things will learn about turtles. When we first started, when Cole, and I, 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 I haven't been with him since day dot, but I've been with him for a long time, but when Cole first started his research as a child down at Monterey Park, because he used to, his dad used to take him down there to see turtles, like most Bunbury people did um, in the early days. Um, and when Cole started his research, the old timers told him the turtles came ashore every year and laid eggs. And Cole thought, you, you did. And um, they were right. They saw turtles every year laying eggs, but they weren't the same turtles. As soon as Cole started tagging turtles, he discovered they only nested every three or four years, not every 12 months. They were looking at a similar number of turtles every year, but it was different turtles. It wasn't the same turtles. So that's most things that have been learned about turtles over the years have been learned at Monterey Park, and we've sent the information out to America and all sorts of places where they have turtles, and so they've um, built on our information that we've gathered over the years. Okay, turtle tracks. Most of you have walked around with the sand here on the island and seen turtle tracks in the sand. Of course, if you know a little bit about turtles, you can look at the track and tell what turtle actually was up on the, on, on the beach. And you can also tell whether that track is going up the beach or going back to the water by looking at the track. So that particular one was made by a loggerhead. Yes. Without going into great um, information, a loggerhead walks up the beach with a right-left, right-left movement, just like you and I or a dog or a cat walks, one leg after the other. So you've got your rear flippers here are the inside marks and your front flippers, and if you line them, if you draw a line through them, you've got a line running at an angle across the track like that because she's putting one flipper after the other as she walks up the track. But if you look at this track, this track was made by a green turtle. And the main thing you're looking at there, the green turtle uses what we call a together gun. 
she drops both flippers into the sand at one time and drags her body forward. So if you connect the rear flippers, you've got a straight line across her track. You connect her front flippers, you've got a straight line across her track. So she's dropping both flippers into the sand at one time and, uh, and walking up the beach. And the greens, most times, not always, but 99% of the time, they also leave a telltale mark in the middle like that, and that's their little tail that's hanging out the back of the turtle. And that little point is where she's pulled up and lifted her flippers forward, okay? So if you can't recognise how the sand's pulled on the flippers, meaning that's the way she's walking, you look at this with a green, and if the point is pointing that way, the little point in the sand is that way, she was going this way. If it's this way, she was going that way, you know what I mean? So the point is the sand. Quite a few little tricks you can come up with when you're looking at it. And the last track I'm going to actually show you without boring you about track is our Australian flatback. And that's totally different and the different thing you're looking at there is the flatback's rear flippers. The flatback is more of a square curve I, I, I talk about. So its rear flippers are the same length as its front flippers. So you've got both front and rear flippers all in the mingle together. Uh, and the flatback also walks up by dropping two flippers into the sand and dragging her body forward. Now the crazy thing about that with turtles, and there's a lot of crazy things about turtles, would you believe as little tiny hatchlings, and you'll see it tonight when you go up there to, to watch me release these hatchlings, as little baby hatchlings, they all race across the beach running right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. But when the greens come back as adults, they use a together game. But they run down to the beach with little hatchlings using right, left, right, left like any other animal. Okay. Any questions yet? Yeah, are you happy for me to rattle on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, that's a big green heading out um, on one of the islands that we're doing some work on one. So they are massive turtles that time. The greens, that's a big one. That, I can assure you that one. A green track um, out on one of the islands that we're working on, um, heading out um, in the morning. And going berserk. I'll show you a photograph that I carry with me as long as it with along with a couple of other little things at the end of it. We are lucky enough here in Australia to have the large the 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 um, heaviest nesting site in the entire world for green turtles. And that's a, a little island up the top of Australia called Rain Island. And Rain Island is not as big as Lady Elliot, it is smaller than Lady Elliot in size. And on a good nesting night on Rain Island, we can record up to 40 thousand nesting greens a night. We can, we can walk from one beach of Rain Island to the other side of Rail Island without touching the sand, just walking on turtle back. But sadly to say, you can imagine what's happening. They're happily digging everybody else's eggs out every night. So the entire island is filled with eggs the first night they start laying at the start of the season. The second night, in comes the wave of turtles, digs them all out and lays their eggs. So Rain Island supports the largest um, seabird colony of any island also in Australia because they're happily feeding on turtle eggs every day. Uh, people have got us at times, and I might mention, on a, I don't know whether I should mention a name, I suppose I could, David Attenborough got at us years ago and said, why don't you guys do something about Rain Island if um, this is happening? Well, if, this is when um, turtle numbers were declining many years ago, but they're not now. And uh, all that David Attenborough did by, by writing to Cole and making that comment was prove that he doesn't know everything. Because the moment a turtle egg is moved, two hours after it has been laid, it is dead. You have two hours in which to move turtle eggs. 
And I can assure you of that because I have run from one end of the beach at Monterey Cove to the other many, many times in 30 years to get the, tur the eggs back in the sand in that two hour time slot. If you move a turtle egg after it's been laid for longer than two hours, you will immediately kill it. So what happens is the turtle egg isn't 100% full of liquid. There's an air pocket. There's an air pocket in the top of every egg. And simply by, by being laid in the egg chamber, that air pocket of course is at the top of every egg, okay? And the tiny little, um, the egg has a, has, a, has a membrane around the edge of the liquid against the eggshell around um, where that air pocket is and that membrane starts to attach to that egg within two hours of mum laying the egg into the egg chamber. And you move that egg after two hours, you break that membrane and that egg will never ever develop, it will die. So you only have two hours to move and that causes a big problem all around the world. As you can well imagine, uh, we, we've even had situations at Monday Play where someone's run us up and I don't know if anybody, anybody here knows Bundaberg, most more parks about 14, 15 kilometres away, one of the beaches from Bundaberg, and we've been rung up in the past and said, guess what guys, a turtle laid, because Moore Park does get a few turtles laid, a turtle laid last night and she laid right in the car track where we go off the ramp onto the beach. Oh. Can't do anything about it, because they rang us in the morning and she'd laid last night, and the eggs can't be moved after two hours. Uh, we did move them and we saved a few by being um, super, super careful. So the only way you can do it is, uh, that's me measuring a log ahead to the Monty Poe. I was a couple of years younger there, I got a As you can see, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, working with turtles, uh, a big crowd will gather. That's a daytime nester, as you can see, and that's not doesn't happen very often. It just occasionally happens, for whatever reason, she wanted to get rid of her load of eggs, and she came up in the middle of the day, so people build up everywhere, because Monty Co is a swimming beach of a daytime. We don't stop people from swimming. That's not a problem. Uh, putting a tag in a turtle, so that's what I spent me 30 years doing in Monterey Cove, tagging and marking turtles so that we can identify them and so on. Um, I'm not doing it out here in my retirement, I'm just rescuing little baby hatchlings. That's a loggerhead turtle. Now her scientific name is Coretta Coretta, but everybody here I'm sure knows her as a loggerhead. Um, and she gets that common name because she has a big head compared with the rest of her body. Now she's a smaller turtle than the green turtle and yet she has a head that's nearly twice the size. So that's where she gets that common name loggerhead from. Coretta Coretta is her scientific name. Turtle tear, any children here? A couple of children? Um, turtle tears. We used to put we used to have the kids on at Monterey Poe in the old days and we used to tell them that look at that. She's laying so many eggs that she's crying. She's in pain. And would you believe what we discovered was that that liquid flows out of her eyes when she's out of the water and um, that is salt. When we, when we examine that liquid, when we analyse that liquid, it is 82% pure salt. So she's excreting a salt um, solution out of her eyes when she's out of the water to help to keep her eyes moist and so that the dry land doesn't affect her eyes, okay? Because she's a creature that lives in the water. And that's a crazy thing to start with, isn't it, if you stop and think about it. They're born under the earth, on dry land, but they run to the water and spend their whole life in the ocean. In fact, male turtles, once they enter the water as little baby hatchlings, never come back out of the water for the rest of their entire life. It's only females that come up when they're 30 years of age and mate for the first time. They come offshore every few years to lay their egg, but the males never ever come back out of the water, and yet they're born on dry land. Crazy animals. Loggerhead dropping eggs in the egg chamber at Monterey Poe because we're working with every turtle that comes ashore. We never miss a turtle at Monterey Poe or we've been sacked by Dr. Cole Lippers. 
Uh, we, uh, we, we're, we're there every turtle day or night, and what we do at Monry Po is we scoop a bit of sand out, because it's all lovely soft sand, so that people can watch the eggs dropping into the egg chamber. It doesn't worry the turtle in any way. She's facing forward, she digs that egg chamber just with her rip lippers, and she fills it all in as, as per normal, even though we've dug a bit of sand out of it, so it's no problem. If she was to go back to the water with a little bit of a, a concave there, we'd fix it up anyway, because as I say, we're with every turtle that comes ashore. So that's a loggerhead turtle, these are just barnacles on her. Sometimes you'll find that on loggerhead turtles, whereas you don't find that on greens. Greens, because greens forage in amongst seaweeds and seagrass and that, always have a lovely smooth, clear um, shell or carapace, it should be called, but we call it a shell more times than not. Uh, whereas your loggerhead sometimes can be quite grubby and have some barnacles on their shell. A bit of a close up of a turtle dropping eggs. Now that's a loggerhead again, dropping eggs into the egg chamber. Um, now she'll lay two or three eggs at once rather than one if you've never seen it. Um, she'll drop two or three eggs at the one time and as you can see there she's dropped those top two because the rest have got sand on them. So those two have been dropped at that stage and you'll notice they're riding down out of her cloaca um, on a real slimy piece of material that's covering those eggs and letting them ride down so they don't just drop into the egg chamber. Even though they're soft and rubbery, they, uh, that helps them ride down. Uh, the interesting thing about that liquid, would you believe that years ago at Monterey Po, um, we discovered <coughs> that a lot of the nests that we were putting back in the dunes, that the eggs had gone down to the research centre to be weighed and measured which what is what happened within our research, we discovered over some years or some months or whatever at Monterey Park, we discovered that um, a lot of those eggs that we put back in the dunes were getting covered in fungus and not producing as many hatchlings as what the naturally laid um, clutches were. And sort of when something like that happens within research, as you know, um, you go full bore into trying to find out why. So Cole put his head together and started doing some research into it. And would you believe that he discovered that that mucus that's coming out of the turtle that's letting those two eggs ride down is also a very, very good fungicide. And it helps to protect the eggs from fungus. And the eggs that were being taken back to the research some of them were getting fungus on them, some of them weren't, and that blew us away initially. We couldn't work out why the hell all of them did. What we discovered was that those that were getting fungus on it were ones that were researched by the young girls that were helping us at Monterey Po, and they didn't want to get their hands gooey, so they were washing the eggs first before they put them on the scales and measured them, etc. So they didn't get all this gooey stuff on their hands and they were washing that fungicide off the eggs and they were the, um, the fungus was attacking them in the sand. So we can't wash that liquid off them anymore, it must stay there. A lot of things about turtles, that's an egg chamber, we'll let that go. We put a piece, piece of coloured ribbon, piece of tape in with every nest that's laid at Monterey Pope. Um, and that's simply, that's probably a nest we've brought back from somewhere because mum's gone. Um, and that tells us when we process that clutch at the end of the, the, the two months, it tells how many hatchlings emerge and so on. That tells us who laid the eggs, on what night she laid them and all the rest. And that's all, all part of our research. Species of the world, here we go. Okay, so you've got a loggerhead turtle there, or, um, can everybody see that? Oh, yes, right. that's a can you see all right? Or? Yes, sir. Do you want me to move a bit? You're right? Yes. Okay, so that's a loggerhead turtle. We'll just skip through these so that you know which one you're looking at. Um, that's going through the scar down and so on. We won't worry about that. That's your green turtle, so as you can see, she's a larger turtle, but smaller head. So that's the one you'll mainly see here at Lady Elliot. We get an occasional lorry head, mostly green. So. 
Whereas one reverse the other way around, mostly loggerheads with the occasional green. And that just goes through um, their scale count and so forth. So we're not going to get into that tonight. And that's our beautiful Australian flatback. Uh, she's probably like most of us, I think, when we were kids going to school, drew a turtle. We most of us drew a turtle, I think, that had a that had a shell with a turn up on the edge like that. She is like that. That's why that sausage of sand is sitting along there. That sand has been caught in there with her flipping her sand back when she was filling in her egg chamber. So that's our flat back. I can assure you, though, um, nine times out of ten, if you're sneaking up in a, on a dark night at Monrepo looking for a turtle and you haven't looked at the trap on the beach, so you haven't identified the turtle, but you're up in the grass, you know, searching around in the dunes, looking for where the turtle's got to you or where there was a trap up the beach. You can usually tell that you're looking for a flat back because you can smell it, so they absolutely stink. <laughs> and it's to do with the food that they eat. Um, so Dr. Colympus has told me, according to him, the food that they eat gives them unbelievably bad breath. And more times than not, you'll hear somebody say, Oh, we're looking for a flat back because I can smell it. <laughs> What do they eat? Uh, they eat mollusks and, sh and uh, shellfish and barnacles in the water too, so they're carnivores. Okay, so that's your um, hawksbill. Hawksbill, in most cases, that's a juvenile, but hawksbill is in most cases are just a little bit smaller than your loggerhead turtle. Sadly to say, that's probably listed as the most endangered turtle worldwide, and that's because um, um, there's people in some countries overseas that hunt hawksbills to get the pretty shell off there. Yeah. They make jewellery out of the pretty shell ones. But we won't go into that big, big time, um, or it'll take a long time. Do they have a layout? They go up? Do they have a layout? No, they don't lay. You'll see them here in the waters, but they don't lay. Yes. Okay, so that's a um, that's a Kent's Ridley. Um, so we'll go past that one, and I think the next one might be an Olive Ridley. And that's your Olive Ridley. They look very similar, but in fact, if you count the scale pattern on their back, totally different. So um, they don't occur in Australia. The Ridley occur overseas. Mexico is a big area for Ridley nesting. And Ridleys are a little bit different to every other species. Ridleys will nest at any time, day or night. Whereas every other species of turtle comes out of the water after dark to lay her eggs, Ridleys will nest any old time, day or night. Um, and in actual fact, in, on, um, in some um, beaches or in, off the shores of Mexico, um, they have what they call an arabada. So thousands of Ridleys will all pour onto the beach at the one time to lay their eggs. It's just their system, okay? And the biggest turtle of them all, the giant leatherback. So that turtle is absolutely massive and I'll show you a photo that I carry with me and we had a young research lady at Monterey called Linda and she's a normal sized young lady like most of the people here and she went to Barbados for um, six weeks to work on um, leatherbacks just to further her knowledge of turtles while she was still sort of working as a volunteer with us at Monterey Park and I do carry a photo with me of Linda um, squatting down at the front of uh, one of these guys and it just looks like she looks like a crab on the beach in, in comparison. So they are absolutely massive. They're gentle giants, never vicious, but they are massive, massive turtles. Oh, oh there she is. Not in a photograph at all. There she is. So look at Linda. And she's an average sized young lady. And look at the turtle. Massive, massive turtles. Oh, yeah. I, I've never, I've uh, not been fortunate enough to even see one yet. But I said to Cole one night at Monterey Co, I said, Cole, I said, 
how will we ever know if another leatherback crawls up on the beach? He said, easy, Michi. He said, if you've got a track on the beach, and he said, you can lay face down on the beach and stretch your arms out like that, and your two fingertips can't touch the flipper marks, you've got a leatherback. Massive turtle. Metres across those front flippers. Okay, horse will swim out of the ocean. Uh, that's what you guys would have seen out here, those people that are divers, you would have seen one of them swimming around, no doubt. Green swimming across the uh, reef, that's out of Heron, I think that is. Um, we did a lot of our work for many, many years with turtles in the ocean. Uh, we used to dive from um, tinnies, I suppose you call them, we used to dive out of tinnies, capture a turtle in the water and bring her to the surface. And people just ask us, why the hell did you guys ever get involved in doing yeah. that? Well, when you're doing research, you have got to study both female and male. And the male turtle never ever comes out of the water. So we used to have to do what we call turtle rodeo work mm -hmm. out off the shores of Heron. We, we chose Heron because we had a big research station there. And we used to dive in and capture turtles, including males. The only way we got to tag, measure and study males was to capture them in the water and bring them ashore. I might have, I might have a photograph here, your office. Um, but, okay, what's the little girl that's here? She's nearly asleep. What's different about that turtle? It has a long tail. And what does that tell us? Take a guess. It's a male turtle. Okay, so if you can see a turtle out in the ocean with a big long tail as long as my arm sticking out the back, you are looking at a male. Female turtle never has a tail any longer than about as long as my finger sticking out from her body. So a big long tail means you're looking at a male turtle. Um, that's just a juvenile green out in the waters here at Lady Ellie. In actual fact, I just thought it looked really nice, the pattern on its shell. Um, but that can't be used. You might look at that and when I show you the hooks for them, think, well, why don't they use juvenile greens? That shell on the um, green turtle is as thin as a piece, that colour that you're looking at is as thin as a piece of newspaper. Whereas on the Hawksbill turtle, that colour is right through a shell that can be nearly, nearly three eighths of an inch thick. Okay? So it can't be used for anything very pretty, but it's only paper thick. Okay, working with a log here in the water, I can assure you that was way, way, way back in time. We don't even attempt to wear snorkel and mask and wetsuit anymore, we dive straight into the water like I am now, without a shirt on. Because we have a special knack of bringing the turtle to the surface. If you don't know what the knack is, you'll never succeed. And of course, what did they do to me? The first time they took me out in a boat at Heron Island, they said, Michi, this one's yours. <laughs> and all I'd ever seen them do was dive over the boat and bring this turtle to the surface. And I knew no different, so over I went. Now I went, oh, you beauty, hand at the back, hand at the front, like that I, I saw them do. I'm going to bring this one ashore, my first turtle. And the turtle just went, whoom, and away she went. Took me with her, and I was prepared not to let her go, because I was supposed to be catching her, see? So I was hanging on and hanging on, and I'm running out of breath, and I'm running out of breath, and when finally I couldn't breathe anymore, and I let her go, and I come to the surface, I turned around, gasping for breath and the boat's right back down. When I left it, there were three blokes in it and I couldn't see a soul. And all of a sudden, these three heads come up from the side. They were rolling around the bottom of the boat laughing. Because they hadn't told me how to bring her to the surface. It's very easy. You'll never miss a turtle once you're told, but if you're not told, you'll never succeed. They are ten times stronger than we are in the water. What you've got to do is you've got to fool them into thinking you're going to push their head down. 
So you grab them there, if you get it right, you grab them at the tail and at the back of the neck and you push their head down. But you're wanting them to go up. But you try and push it down and she immediately forces it against you. She goes, Phew! I'm not going to be pushed down, I'm going up. And she'll go and she'll bring her body up and as she does, you just help her and hold her in that position and she flaps away and away you go. And up, end up at the top, end up, end up at the top like, bob out of the water like a fork. You'll, you'll get every one, but they didn't show me that, did they? Oh my God. I, th I think they're still, they're still laughing about Mitchie being grabbed half a kilometre away from the back by a big green turtle. Okay, and we will, that's a male turtle mating with a female. And sometimes, out in the ocean, we will witness this. Oh, oh my God. What happens is out there, the female goes through a hormonal change which drives the males crazy. And many males will mount on top of her. I can assure you, the only one that's mating with her is him, one directly on top. But we have seen as many as five males stacked on one female because they're hormonally driven and they want to mate with her and they will stack themselves on top of the guy who is successfully mating. So she'll mate with many, many males when she mates out off the nesting beach about um, two to three weeks before she comes ashore to lay her eggs. She'll go through a huge mating session out there and over a period of, we've had a turtle over a six day period being mated by, with 67 different males. So she can't, she can't control it, the males just take her as they wish. And more times than not, when you find a mated pair of turtles in the water, and I see that a lot out at, um, out at um, North West where I take my wife on holidays every year, um, because it's that time of the year when turtles are mating. And um, more times than not, when you see a mated pair just out from the shore and you look around in an area as big as this room, say, around that mated pair, you'll find anything up to a dozen males just cruising back and forth, back and forth. Of course, the moment he's finished with her, another male takes her. More times than not, as he slides over the left-hand side of her, another male will come up the right-hand side and take her immediately. So she has no control over it, but she's a very clever lady in, the, in, the, in her reproductive um, area because would you believe that she goes through that huge mating session out there with many, many different males and that's what mixes up all the genes. She has the capability of storing the male sperm in an area in her reproductive system. It's not deposited in the eggs initially. And then she fertilizes each 200 eggs that she's going to bring ashore and lay each fortnight. So when she comes ashore, let's say she lays 200 eggs, roughly that's what they do lay, each species. Uh, when she comes ashore to lay her first 200 eggs after that big mating session, all those eggs will be fertile. But we have examined turtles in the past and no other eggs in her body are fertile. And yet she does not mate again. In two weeks' time, she will come ashore and she'll lay another 200 eggs, which will all be fertile. But again, if we examine her internally, no other eggs are fertile. So she's capable of fertilizing her own eggs through the sperm that she gathered from all those males that mated with her. And we think, and I mean this is just a guess by humans, we think it's probably the strongest sperm because there's so many males mated with her, it's probably the strongest sperm that that, that fertilizes more eggs than, than the weaker sperm, if you know what I mean, because all the sperm is in the one tank in her body, so to speak, all mixed up together. She has a liquid that keeps sperm alive, um, and she fertilizes her own eggs. Very clever system, we think. It's a very clever way of doing things. So she's a very clever lady in many, many ways. I can assure you she's like, sucked me into the point where I'm still working with her 50 years after I started working with her. That's here in Ireland. We were doing, uh, uh, we were trying to satisfy the Australian government at that stage. They wanted us, um, those people that are fishermen are aware there's a lot of areas around Australia these days where you've got to go slow for those below. 
uh, way back when the Australian government were trying to implement that system of uh, a, a slow-go zone for fishing boats and so on, they wanted us to tell them where all the major feeding areas were for all our turtles. So we were catching turtles, diving off boat, out of boats and catching turtles in the, in the water at Heron Island, bringing them ashore and we were stomach pumping them to examine the, um, the food they were eating so we could tell what areas of the reef they were feeding on, you know what I mean? And they're all upside down as you can see. I think there's a couple of males amongst them, that's a male. So, um, that might be male. So there's a couple of males amongst them, and they're all upside down. I can assure you that's the most humane way to hold a big marine turtle. They are unbelievably strong, and you can lash the whole four flippers down to anchor points in a boat, and by the time you bring them in three kilometres back to shore, they'll have all four flippers bleed. They are unbelievably strong, so the best thing you can do with them is roll them over onto their back. It doesn't hurt them, we've done some research on them and it doesn't hurt them at all, but they can't right themselves. When they're put on their back, they will actually stay there until the day they die. They cannot flip themselves back over. But the interesting thing about that, different story for their little baby hatchlings, the moment you invert a hatchling, he puts one flipper against his body like that and pushes the other one out and flips straight over. But the adult turtle can't do it. And that's the most humane way of holding it. And we, we were back out chasing more turtles in actual fact and we left this guy there to, just to tell the public why there was turtles on the shore on their back. Because we have done that in the past, left them and gone out to try and get some more before the tide beaters and come back and found them all gone because somebody has turned them over thinking that they had um, they had turned them over their back the wrong way and somebody had flipped them out. So we left that guy there just to explain to people why we've got a holy turtle on the shore on their back. Great right on. I will show you a photograph about that which will blow you away. I have photographs where uh, I, I'll read what's on it. Um, I've forgotten the hell of it exactly what's on it. Okay, hatchlings. I'm almost going to give this away and just simply talk for a little while and then show you the two different hatchlings that I've got. But I'll show you the hatchlings here. Um, so those guys are little loggerheads and I have some of them to show you tonight. So they're little loggerheads, but the ones that most of you have seen already in buckets here are the green hatchlings, which are those guys. So that's your green hatchling. But of course, we're a little bit biased at Monterey Poe and the hatchling that we absolutely love is our flatbacks. Oh, God. So that's how that happened. And a funny story about that was we had a whole bucket of those down in the research centre one night. We were marking them, measuring them, etc. part of our research. And we had a politician there. It may have been Wayne Goss, I'm not sure. It was right back in the early days. And he was there visiting Monterey Poe and looking around and so on. He came into the research centre and he stuck his nose into the bucket or one of the girls was holding one of these, I think, and might have been measuring with a set of calipers or something like that. And he looked at the others in the bucket and he turned to her and he said, can I just ask you a question? She said, yeah, go for it. He said, why have you gone to all the trouble of marking their scales with a black felt pen? Yeah. Oh. Clever politician, eh? <laughs> um, are you guys happy if I turn the lights on at the moment? That's some little green just bust, bust, breaking out of the egg shell, okay? So what happens down there in the egg chamber? Uh, Mum lays the egg, she covers it up and away she goes. She's the best mother in the world. Never has anything to do with her eggs or her young. Wouldn't even recognise them in the water. A lot of mothers at Monterey Poe, when I've told them that, they've said, wow, can I be a turtle? <laughs> um, so she covers those eggs up and away she goes in two months time 
those eggs hatch out. And if they do the right thing, and 99.9% .9 of them do, they should all hatch out within 24 hours. All the little hatchlings should break out. It's, it's, it's the action of one little guy cutting his way out of the eggshell that gets the rest of them, just like hen's chickens. They tell me that hen's chickens do the same thing. And they're aware of that one little guy moving and they will all feverishly, excuse me, start cutting themselves out of their rubbery eggshell, okay? And then they start digging to the surface. When we see them come out of the sand of a night time, if we were sort of on a beach of where, where we saw them actually emerging out of the sand, they have already been digging to the surface for a week. It takes them in normal sand, out here there's a big problem because of the coral rubble as you know, but in normal sand it takes them a week to dig their way up through 70 centimetres of sand and reach the surface. And of course that wasn't too hard to prove, we did a lot of our work in laboratories in, um, in containers where we can watch them uh, under special lights and everything. It takes them a week to dig their surface. Now the first little guy, when he gets close to the surface, and it's usually about four inches in the old scale, 100 millimetres these days, is it? When he gets about 100 millimetres from the surface on a normal sandy beach, the sand collapses on top of them. The moment that sand, that sand collapses, they stop digging. The top dozen that are in that egg chamber don't dig one more pipper full of sand out, and the rest know that the top body of hatchling has stopped, so we've got to stop crawling as well. And they all stop crawling and digging the moment that collapse occurs. And what they do is they wait for the temperature to drop. And as soon as the temperature drops, they know the sun has gone down and they will continue to dig their way out. And that's how they know it's night time. So that's why 99.9% .9 of all hatch clutches on a normal beach will come out after dark. The only time we've seen that fail at Mondry Po over the years, occasionally we'll see it fail if they've reached that point of collapse early in the morning. Um, and we get a, a bit of light rain that cools the sand right down. Uh, they'll make a mistake and we'll have clutches running down the water in the middle of the afternoon thinking that it's night time. They don't know that it's, um, I might add, in that, in that sand collapse that I talked about, they don't know that it's night time when that collapse occurs, right? All they know is they've got to wait till the temperature drops. So if they dig up to that fish position at 10 o'clock tonight and the sand collapses, they stop digging and tomorrow morning the sun comes up and the temperature of the sand rises. They don't respond to that. It's not until the sun goes down tomorrow night that they respond to it and come out after dark. Probably those nests that get caught like that, probably the guys that are underneath that top body, probably smack them over the head with their flipper and say, you bloody idiots, we could have got out last night. Um, but that's what they do. That's how they know it's night time. We didn't know for a long time what was their mechanism of how they knew it was night time. And that's what they do. But we, once we discovered that, we could fool them, if you know what I mean? We could go along at Monterey Park because we know where every nest is. It's all measured out, the grid markers on the beach. And we could have a look on the computer and say, yeah, blah, 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 nest A, B, C, and D are due out Wednesday night or whatever. We could go along the beach and we could have a look at that nest at um, 10 o'clock in the morning, and if it had collapsed, meaning they were sitting there waiting, we could put four sparks star pickets in the sand, pull a tarp over it, um, and cool the sand right down, and they would make a mistake and come out two hours later and race off to the beach. So they're simply working to the, the drop in the sand temperature. Um, I might what have I got? I'll just, I'll just show you a couple more shots and then we'll get away. Okay, that's um, a loggerhead hatchling and a loggerhead egg. To give you a bit of an idea, that hatchling is really larger than that egg when you look at it and yet it's just been born. When they're inside the egg, they're curled up totally in a circle and their little nose is touching their tail. So they are totally curled up in a circle when they're in the shell. And that's the difference between a loggerhead hatchling and a 
Australian flatback action.